Uh, welcome everyone to the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine's Grand Rounds, and welcome to those of you who are streaming live out in uh, virtual land. Um, my name is Peter Wayne, and I'm the research director here at the Osher Center. So as you know, we alternate uh, monthly between research grand rounds and clinical grand rounds. And this month, uh, we have a research grand round. And it's uh, my pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Vitali Napado, who's both a good friend and, and a colleague. Uh, Vitali's a unique scientist that's capable of integrating both rigor rigorous biomedical research with a deep and first-hand understanding of traditional integrative therapies. Vitali is an associate professor at the Martino Center for Biomedical Imaging at Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School, where he's also the director of the Center for Pain and Neuroimaging. Um, Vitali uh, also holds a secondary appointment at the Pain Management Center here at Brigham Women's Hospital, and he practices just downstairs from our OSHA Center at uh, 850 Boylston. Um, he received his PhD in biomedical engineering from the Harvard, MIT Health Sciences and Technology Program, and he also received an acupuncture degree from the New England School of Acupuncture. I first met Vitali through our work on the Society for Acupuncture Research Board, uh, where Helen Longevin, he and I also uh, served together for many years, and Vitali has been president or was president for a number of recent years. Vitali's laboratory leads a number of pioneering studies which have applied non-invasive neuroimaging techniques to better understand the brain circuitry, specifically underlying chronic pain conditions, and also to better understand how non-pharmacological therapies um, impact pain. Some of his NIH-funded work, uh, work has included understanding the neurobiology of acupuncture for carpal tunnel syndrome, placebo effects in knee and back pain, and most recently, the neurobiology of patient-practitioner interactions um, using this cutting-edge paradigm called hyperscanning, where both the patient and the practitioner are being scanned simultaneously to understand their concordance. Um, I hope we can get him back here to talk about that really soon as well. The work he's going to be presenting today um, is funded by a very competitive uh, NIH pro program project, a PO1 grant, which means a three R01s put together, um, for which he serves as the principal investigator, uh, along with uh, Dr. Bruce Rogan, Rose, uh, Rosen. Vitali has more than 130 publications in peer-reviewed scientific journals and received a number of awards, including just last month the Distinguished Investigator Award by the Academy of Radiology and Biomedical in uh, Imaging. So without any further delay, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Vitali Napadov. Thanks very much, Peter, for that um, uh, very kind introduction. Oh, thank you. I'm okay. And uh, uh, first of all, I apologize for um, missing the, um, my previously scheduled talk, but I hope to make it up to you by actually showing you the results of some preliminary data that I didn't have the last time I was scheduled to talk. So it's kind of exciting to, to be here as well for that. So today um, I'm going to be talking about uh, neuromodulation. And uh, one of my contentions is that neuromodulation does have significant overlap with mind-body therapies, including acupuncture, in particular electroacupuncture. And so part of what I'm going to be doing today is actually trying to make that link a little bit better. And, you know, as, as we take some of these mind-body practices that I think, you know, previously might have been interpreted as more alternative and are brought in in a more integrative fashion into, um, into the clinics and into research. So first, I start with some uh, disclosures. Uh, what I'll be talking to you today about is um, this Ravens technology and the algorithms and the device is something that I developed um, more than a decade ago and uh, was patented by Mass General Hospital and um, it has been licensed and is being developed by a company in California, a medical device company. And also disclosures around uh, my funding for this device, uh, which span multiple NIH institutes um, for development of the research behind this device. So I'm going to start uh, this talk by talking about um, the rhythms of the body, and uh, specifically respiration. Uh, respiration is very interesting. The lungs are very interesting in that it's uh, partially considered an autonomic organ and autonomically innervated, but some people bristle about the, 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 um, the fact that this is really an autonomic organ and refer to it more as automatic, and partially that's because it's also volitionally controlled. It's one of the few sort of autonomic organs. We can't 
necessarily control our heart and how fast our heart beat, but we can control our respiration rate. We can take deep breaths or shallow breaths or change our respiratory rate volitionally. And so you see here that there is, let me see, do I have a um, pointer? Yeah. So you see here that there is a, um, a rhythm generator in the brain leading to pattern generations for control of the diaphragm muscles that then controls breathing. And this uh, pattern generator in the brain, this is from a, a very nice review on this topic, by the way, that I uh, definitely want to highlight uh, that's very recent, talks about this nucleus called the pre-Botzinger nucleus over here in the ventral pontomedullary junction. So this is the medulla. It's a little bit complicated. This is um, from a, a rat, basically. This is the cerebellum. So this is the posterior. This is anterior. The brain would be up here, the spinal cord down here. So you can see kind of the ventral part of the uh, pontomedullary junction is where this uh, Botzinger complex and the pre-Botzinger nucleus is located. And this is thought to be the main rhythm generator of respiration in the body. And so these are uh, slices through that. And I'm, I'm going through this detail with you because I'll be talking about this throughout the talk. Um, so you can see here's lateral and then ventral areas. The pre nucleus is more anterior and a little bit more posterior are nuclei such as the nucleus tractus solitarius which is the main um, afferent relay for the vagus nerve and the spinal trigeminal nucleus over here. So we'll be coming back to this as the talk goes on. So I think what's been interesting is that breathing actually causes respiration-locked oscillations in the brain. So you could, you could say, well, that's not so surprising for areas such as the olfactory bulb, right? This is the main entryway for air. And so you can see that there's rhythms and spiking in this part of the brain that's in tune with the respiratory rhythm. But look at all these other areas, everything from the prefrontal cortex, somatosensory cortex. So this is somatosensory or tactile perception. A lot of these areas that we previously thought had really nothing to do with respiration, the brain activity in these areas has also been found to be locked to the respiratory rhythm to some degree. And uh, if we go, you say, well, this maybe it's just a rat. Well, if we also look at humans, uh, there have been studies with um, sort of indwelling electrodes, intracortical EEG electrodes. So these are typically patients with epilepsy where these electrodes are implanted and you know, while they are implanted, you can also record from them. So there's been a lot of research that's been done with what's called IEEG, or you know, intracranial electroencephalography. And so one of these studies found that um, areas such as, so, so this, this area right here is in the, um, um, the, the olfactory bulb as well, piriformis cortex. And this, the spiking in this area and the local field potential is also found to be in tune with the respiratory rhythm. So in red is the respiratory rhythm over here, but also other areas and affect processing areas such as the amygdala also were found to have activity and spiking activity and local field potential average that's in tune with the respiratory rhythm. And what was really interesting about this paper is that they found that there was actually behavioral effects that were modulated by whether stimuli were delivered during different phases of respiration. So, so this was a cognitive task, finding that memory performance was more accurate if the stimuli are presented during inspiration, for example. So when we breathe in, we are better at remembering the stimulus that is delivered during that time than if the same stimulus is delivered during exhalation. That's really fascinating. But also fear processing. So if fearful faces are detected quicker if they're presented during inspiration. And this paper also went on to talk about differences between nasal versus oral breathing. I'm not going to get into that. But the point here is that there are these sort of behavioral effects that are modulated by the respiratory rhythm. And I think that's really fascinating. So respiration just in itself, we know, has, can have strong effects on stress and stress processing. So a consciously controlled change in respiration can lead to a change in cognitive and emotional states. So, for example, with affect, you can have slow and deep breathing. This is, a, this is a type of behavioral therapy that's taught to patients to control everything from, you know, generalized anxiety to depression to post-traumatic stress disorder. And so there have been different interventions that have developed, been developed around this concept, including, say, mindfulness meditation. And um, there was a really nice review that was recently published um, trying to better understand the neurobiology of mindfulness training and mindfulness meditation from the sort of the prism of neuroscience and neuroimaging, talking about connections between the 
back to the pre-Botzinger nucleus, which is, again, over here in the uh, medulla, and how this nucleus actually spans out and connects to diffuse neurotransmitter systems, such as in the locus ceruleus, which then can have a diffuse effect on many, many, many different brain systems in higher cortical areas. So one research question is, can respiratory rhythms be used to enhance the effects of other clinical therapies, for example, neuromodulation? And so I want to take um, also uh, the interesting thing here is that when talking about neuromodulation is that respiration also has been linked with mind-body therapies such as acupuncture and Chinese medicine. So for example, respiratory rhythms were actually mentioned as an important for acupuncture needling in as far back as the Huangdi Neijing, which is one of the oldest texts of Chinese medicine. So this is in chapter 27, when an exhalation is completed, insert the needle. Right, so there are these concepts, and in, if you go to acupuncture school, part of what your training is involved in is modulating when the needle is inserted or even withdrawn from the body based on the respiratory rhythm of the subject. So most acupuncturists are following the respiratory rhythm of the patient and either inserting or withdrawing the needle based on how they see the chest move up and down during the therapy, which is really interesting. And there was actually a study that I found back in the 1990s that looked at this specifically. This was out of Japan. And um, um, uh, Nishijo, this guy Nishijo down here, is a, um, uh, a pretty uh, prolific uh, acupuncture researcher in Japan. Actually, I think the study was done in, in, in Toronto, but it was through um, Nishijo's lab. And they found that if you exhalation gate the acupuncture needle stimulation, you can have enhanced uh, clinical or physiological effects. In this case, it was a headache severity um, when the needle was being stimulated during exhalation versus continuously stimulated throughout the experiment. And so this is one of the studies that actually gave me the original ideas of coupling respiration with other neuromodulatory therapies. So I want to take a little step back and talk about neuromodulation. So what, what is neuromodulation? It's, it's become a little bit of a buzzword, but technically speaking, neuromodulation is the alteration of nerve activity through, through the delivery of electrical stimuli or chemical agents at targeted sites of the body. This is a definition by the International Neuromodulation Society. So the skin just happens to be a very convenient place for us to Im impact and input different energies, such as electrical stimulation. So um, from early neuromodulation, there's actually some evidence that ancient Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans used electrical fish to generate electric shocks for pain relief. And um, electrical eels in South America uh, have been used to treat disorders such as headache. This is actually a quote from um, a treatise in the uh, 18th century, 1762, when a slave complains of a bad headache, he has them put one of their hands on their head and the other on the fish, and they thereby will be helped immediately without exception. You know, very strong uh, placebo effects there. Um, this is from the 18th century. So also in the 18th century, electrical machines were then used for headache and other pain disorders. So we transferred from fish to actual uh, machines and devices that were created. And this really started early in the 18th century and moved forward as we learned more and more about electricity and the work of folks such as Nikolai Tesla. In the 19th century, there was further development. For example, the hydroelectric bath was used to treat headache. This is probably not a good idea to, <laughs> to include um, uh, electrical stimulation devices uh, with a bathtub. But there's also limitations of some of the early neuromodulation approaches that were quickly noted. First of all, it's not particularly spatially localized. If you're just lying in a bathtub and somebody inserts you know, electricity into that bathtub, you're not really spatially localizing or targeting specific nerve fibers, or at least not based on innervation and cranial peripheral nervous system. Also, it was very early understood that there's other components of neuromodulation, such as placebo effects. For example, this is the German physician Mobius. There is no other way out. It concerns suggestion. I have occasionally pointed to the fact that in mild migraine attacks, psychic influences are important. Therefore, it is obvious that in, that in such type of attack, electric manipulations will bring immediate well-being, in particular if it is carried out by an appropriate personality. Right? So this is basically before the placebo effect term was coined, 
you know, people were aware that there's other things going on here besides electrical stimulation. And so that's something that I think the neuromodulation field in general uh, needs to take more into account in um, trying to understand the research behind the things that are being done and being labeled as neuromodulation. But having said all that, there has been a wide, wide proliferation now of more targeted uh, peripheral nerve uh, modulation devices. Uh, these have been termed uh, electroceuticals. So electroceuticals is kind of a way for the pharmaceutical industry to get involved in neuromodulation. Uh, this was um, a really kind of a hallmark paper in Nature in 2013 by Peter Pham, who's uh, with GSK, as they started up their, um, their, uh, their group for looking at neuromodulation and electroceuticals. But as you can see, there's been really a proliferation of these devices targeting different nerves, everything from you know, the median nerve um, to uh, the vagus nerve with this uh, device called uh, Electrocore that um, has come out recently um, he targeting headache, everything from migraine headache to overactive bladder to hypertension uh, to es essential tremor. And so there's a lot of these devices out there. And uh, I think it's really kind of early days for our understanding of which devices might be beneficial for which disorders. And more research is needed. So I'm going to talk specifically about uh, vagus nerve stimulation. And vagus nerve stimulation is a neuromodulatory approach that was originally developed to treat epilepsy and has been FDA approved for decades uh, to treat this condition. But it's also, um, what was interesting is that uh, while this device was implanted, and you can see it's kind of like a pacemaker-like device that then has a lead that coils around the, the, the main trunk of the vagus nerve, over here in the, uh, in the neck, uh, what was found is that patients that were suffering from both epilepsy and other disorders, such as depression, were also benefiting for uh, antidepressive effects of the therapy. And so the other aspect is that if you look at the vagus nerve and you look at all the visceral organs that are innervated by the vagus nerve, it's, it's a pretty short jump to try to figure out that maybe stimulating the vagus nerve can be effective for multiple conditions and multiple pathologies associated with different visceral organs, as well as uh, more neurological disorders. And so there's been research for vagus nerve stimulation in a whole host of conditions, everything from rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, obesity, cardiovascular disease, depression, bipolar disorder. Um, the list goes on. And I, I don't think my intent is actually to claim that vagus nerve stimulation is effective for all these disorders. But it's just that research is needed to try to figure out what vagus nerve stimulation is going to be more effective for. So however, vagus nerve stimulation is an invasive procedure, and it's associated with significant side effects and surgical morbidities. And so the development and optimization of more non-invasive alternatives to vagus nerve stimulation is also important. There's only going to be a certain uh, percentage of the population that's going to go for surgery um, to have these kinds of devices implanted. So there is, uh, um, there's actually been two different types of transcutaneous vagus nerve stimulation. One of them is transcutaneous auricular vagus nerve stimulation, or TAVNS, is a non-invasive form of vagus nerve stimulation that involves stimulation of the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. And that's really interesting that there's actually a branch of the vagus that goes out through the jugular ganglion and it exits out to the ear, right? And there's actually a very specific part of the ear that's innervated by the vagus nerve. And so this is a, um, one of the early uh, anatomical dissection studies. This was uh, 14 ears from seven cadavers, very meticulous dissection done from a group in Germany, Poiker et al., that found that a very specific part of the ear called the symbaconcha, or symbaconca, which is over here in the ear, is, was 100% innervated by the ABVN, or the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. So this is the, you know, the greater auricular nerve, um, and there's other nerves that are innervating other portions of the ear, but there are portions of the ear that are primarily innervated by the auricular branch of the vagus nerve, and uh, in, in their sample, at least in their ears that they um, dissected, 100% uh, of the, um, of the cadavers of the ears that they dissected, the symbaconcha was innervated by the ABBN. So interestingly, if we look at uh, auricular acupuncture, there are portions of the ear that if we look in the symbaconcha and the cavum concha, which are the two kind of areas that are most innervated by the auricular branch of the vagus nerve, 
this is where we see the visceral organs that can be affected in auricular acupuncture. So there's this actually really nice match between what we now know to be innervated by the vagus nerve, by the auricular branch of the vagus nerve, and you know, what's been um, hypothesized for a long time as part of uh, Chinese medicine um, to be associated with the visceral organ innervation of auricular territories. So I think just an interesting link there. So let's talk a little bit about the ABVN, the auricular branch of the vagus nerve, uh, transfers uh, input from the simba concha and the concha in general from the oracle through the jugular ganglion and to this area of the uh, pons and medulla, the very long nucleus called the NTS, the nucleus tractus solitarius. That is the primary afferent nucleus for the vagus nerve, the main trunk of the vagus nerve, but also for the auricular branch of the vagus nerve, which, because it's also carrying somatosensory input, also transfers information to SP5, or the spinal trigeminal nucleus, which is just over here. So here's NTS, a little bit more medial, a little bit more dorsal, and here is SP5, a little bit more lateral, and a little bit more ventral. The fibers that course through the auricular branch of the vagus nerve are typically myelinated fibers. Uh, both A delta and A beta fibers have been identified, uh, maybe a little bit more uh, A delta fibers than A beta fibers, but A delta fibers are a lot thinner. And interestingly, the, um, I don't think I mentioned this before, but the main trunk of the vagus nerve is actually, even though it's innervating all these organs, it's actually 80% afferents. So 80% of the, of the main vagus nerve is carrying information from the viscera up to the brain, not the other way around, not just in controlling these organs. And that's very interesting because when people are using implanted surgical vagus nerve stimulation to affect different disorders, uh, it might not be anything having to do with actual innervation of those organs, directly motor innervation of those organs. It might be through a loop through the brain. So uh, transcutaneous vagus nerve stimulation and auricular TVNS has been used for uh, applications for migraine. Um, so this is a, actually a device was developed in Germany. This is, this is the CerboMed device that um, was approved by the FDA actually recently for migraine. And this is one of their clinical trials showing improvements in the number of headache days uh, per month in patients. Uh, in this case, they compared one hertz stimulation to 25 hertz stimulation. They actually got, both groups got better, but they actually got better results with one hertz stimulation, which was kind of interesting because I'm pretty sure when they designed the study, they were doing this as a dose response study. But, um, but they actually found that one hertz stimulation was better than 25 hertz. And, you know, it, could this be due to a re reduction in habituation? Because maybe if you just like hammer this thing at 25 hertz repeatedly, 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 um, you're actually causing, um, you know, some deleterious effects. Uh, through habituation of the nervous system to this constant barrage, and maybe it's one hertz stimulation was more effective because you give the, the system a little bit of a delay to recover before the next uh, input comes in. Just kind of interesting hypothesis. I actually have no idea whether that's true or not. Um, the clinical benefits in this paper were hypothesized to actually be from connections from the NTS to diffuse neurotransmitter systems from, say, the serotonergic system from the dorsal raphe over here or the norogenergic system through the locus ceruleus over here. And so this has been a, a main connection. And I talked about this a little bit before with respiration, with connections between preboxinor nucleus and areas such as locus ceruleus in the brainstem. But you can also get at these nuclei from the nucleus tractus solitarius. So interestingly, the NTS, the nucleus tractus solitarius, in addition to being the primary afferent um, uh, relay for the vagus nerve is also a key node of the respiratory, of respiratory sinus arrhythmia. This is this concept that uh, cardiac rhythms are actually increased during inhalation and decreased during exhalation. This is, uh, this is a normal condition. This happens in, in everybody, and it's referred to as respiratory and sinus arrhythmia. And this is thought to be basically arise from the idea that during inspiration, we have a reduction in thoracic pressure, which increases venous return, increases baroreceptor firing, which leads to a decrease in efferent vagal tone, which then leads to an increase in heart rate. So that's why every time we breathe in, our heart rate goes a little bit faster. Every time we breathe out, our heart rate slows down. And so it's through these connections from NTS, which is the main relay of the vagus nerve, to the nucleus ambiguous, 
which is the main motor, premotor nucleus of the heart, right? This is when we control cardiac rhythms to the SA node. It's from principally the nucleus ambiguous. And it's from this, this inhibitory connection from NTS to the nucleus ambiguous that moderates respiratory sinus arrhythmia. And vagus nerve traffic is normally in synchrony with respiration. That's kind of the point, and that's very interesting. From receptors, lung stretch receptors in the lungs, but also in tune with respiratory sinus arrhythmia. So our TVNS approach gates ABVN stimulation to the respiratory rhythm. And so this is the, the acronym we gave it as RAVENS, Respiratory Gated Auricular Vagal Afferent Nerve Stimulation. And so there's several advantages here. One is that compared to continuous TVNS, the gating of stimuli produces irregular stimulation, which potentially mitigates the habituation of NTS in the brain response. You know, this idea that before, you know, maybe the previous clinical trial of TVNS was actually better for one hertz stimulation because of the re reduction in habituation that happens. And so can we get at this by doing this regular stimulation, by gating the stimulation to the respiratory rhythm? And so the, the device basically monitors respiration in real time. And based on that, the computer algorithm then controls a relay connection that then allows st electrical stimulation to either flow or to cease, right? So we have a, an electrode that's implanted. It's not implanted. It's placed into the ear and you have the surface stimulation that's imparted in tune with the respiratory cycle. So every time you, you breathe in, no stimulation, you breathe out, and during the exhalatory breath, you can deliver stimulation. Another advantage of this is that Ravens potentially transmits afferents to the NTS during a receptive facilitatory state for, uh, in specific exhalation. So the idea here is that during, during inspiration, you have this other competing afferents coming to the same nuclei, the NTS, from lung stretch receptors. So every time the lungs inflate, you have these stretch receptors that go off, and then you have this afferents coming up to the NTS, also along the vagus nerve, and so you don't want to compete with that, right? But also, you have these top-down influences, and that's because it's known that influence from the pre or nucleus to the NTS is inhibitory during inhalation and facilitatory during exhalation. So you're also, you're kind of avoiding this potentially dead period or this deleterious period of stimulation by only imparting stimulation during the, um, a, a part of the respiratory cycle that's facilitatory, and that's exhalation. That was our hypothesis in developing this. So I'm going to now go through some of our preliminary research studies with Ravens. For example, do chronic pain patients exhibit improved pain processing in response to exhalatory gated TVNS? Is there enhanced neurophysiological response to exhalatory gated TVNS? Does Ravens modulate trigeminal sensory processing for migraine patients? And can Ravens be synergistic with other respiratory-based therapies, such as mindfulness meditation training? And I'll touch on all of these things through these, through these next few slides. Um, our recent publication, I'll start with the neurophysiology. So I'm, I come from a neuroimaging center. We do a lot of neuroimaging research. And so in this study, we actually um, just took some healthy adults and we, um, we performed TVNS and um, ins inspiratory and exhalatory gated TVNS during a, what's called 7T or ultra high field fMRI imaging. And the idea of using this ultra high field scanner is that it allowed us to really reduce the spatial resolution and um, improve the temporal resolution of our imaging because you have so much more signal at these higher magnetic fields. So this is more of a research scanner, the, um, the 7T MRI scanner that we have access to. And you can see that the spatial resolution is at 1.2 millimeter isotropic, which is, which is actually very good for functional MRI. And in, in this case, it's kind of important for assessing nuclei in the brainstem, which tend to have a very small cross-sectional area. And so we had uh, different conditions here. We had TVNS delivered during exhalatory phase of respiration, or E-Ravens, during the inhalatory phase of respiration, or I-Ravens. And then we also had a control where we delivered stimulation, still exhalatory gated, but not to a vagus um, innervated part of the ear. So this is the earlobe, which is basically uh, innervated by the greater auricular nerve. So this was our, another control that we did. So we did several controls in this experiment. And um, you can see over here uh, the E-Ravens versus I-Ravens versus exhalatory gated stimulation of the earlobe, or, the, or what we call GAN, or greater auricular nerve control. Um, 
There was, um, uh, the controls were actually pretty good. There was no differences in the amount of current that was used. We, uh, the intensity that was felt by the subjects was also matched across these different conditions. And the number of events, because we're actually not controlling when we're stimulating, it's the subject that's controlling when we're stimulating by their respiratory rhythm. There was also no difference in the number of stimulation events across all of these conditions. And so what we found is that the uh, group response across individuals for exhalatory uh, ravens, e-ravens, was uh, uh, quite robust. And we got nice activation in um, cluster over here, which is part, probably uh, nucleus tractus solitarius and um, spinal chord geminal nucleus, SP5. Also, potentially the nucleus ambiguous, and maybe even the preboxinger nucleus over here in the um, uh, just adjacent to the um, to the olive. Uh, when the same stimulation was delivered during inhalation, we surprisingly didn't see very much at all happening in the brainstem. It's actually a little bit surprising that there was so little going on there. Um, in contrast, when we stimulated during exhalation, but in a non-vagal territory in the ear, we also got very nice activation. But in this case, it was, I would argue, a little bit more lateral and a little bit more anterior and probably more consistent with the spinal trigeminal nucleus over here, SP5. And you can see um, all these different activations and even the overlap in here in blue um, for the, um, uh, the vagus territory stimulation during exhalation versus the earlobe stimulation during exhalation. When we directly compared the exhalatory to the inhalatory condition um, to try to see if there's really a difference there, we did in fact see a very nice activation over here, which is very consistent with nucleus tractus solitarius similar area in the pontomedullary junction. So it's basically over here. This, this is the pons of the brainstem. This is the medulla. This is a cross section through this area over here. And also, if we did a region of interest analysis for specific nuclei that we know are source nuclei for um, diffuse neurotransmitter systems, such as the serotonergic system, the dorsal raphe nuclei, median raphe nuclei, and the noradrenergic system over here, the locus ceruleus, we found a much better response here for um, exhalatory gated TVNS compared to the, actually all both other conditions, including the earlobe stimulation. So while the earlobe stimulation is actually quite effective in stimulating the spinal trigeminal nucleus in the medulla, it seems to be less effective in actually transferring information up to these um, important diffuse neurotransmittory source areas, such as locus ceruleus and these raphe nuclei. We also looked at um, heart rate variability response. So this is now feedback loop to the heart. So we monitored heart rate variability and the high frequency component of heart rate variability has been associated with cardiovagal modulation or paras greater parasympathetic drive to the heart. And we found better, um, better sort of activation of this system with exhalatory gated Raven stimulation compared to inhalatory gated Raven stimulation as well. So it's not just targeting the, the um, uh, NTS in the brainstem, that's better when you stimulate during the exhalatory phase, but it's also this feedback loop that can be activated down to the heart, which is really interesting. Uh, we recently repeated uh, these studies um, on, a, on a different scanner, uh, this time a 3T scanner, and here we compared different frequencies of stimulation. So in the previous study was done with a lower frequency. We thought maybe we would be better if we stimulate with a higher frequency, but again, with this irregular timing. And in fact, you know, that was the case. At 100 hertz, we actually got, we found that there was much better activation of NTS um, in the brainstem compared to the other conditions, uh, including uh, 2 hertz, 10 hertz, and 25 hertz, which is interesting. And so our subsequent studies are now using 100 hertz stimulation um, for, for our, um, our device implementations. Um, this is one of our earlier studies, so now moving to Raven's uh, research that we've done with um, different clinical disorders. So this is Raven's research that we did with chronic pelvic pain patients. We did what's called a QST, or quantitative sensory testing study. So this was not longitudinal. This was just a single visit, and this was actually the first Raven's uh, publication that we had. And um, so it was a single visit. They did either Raven stimulation or we had a control stimulation um, of, the, of the earlobe. So again, exhalatory gated, but now the stimulation is happening at a control location in the earlobe. 
and we found um, much better um, hypoalgesia, so reduction of hyperalgesia for pressure pain stimulation on the calf of the leg, also reduction in temporal summation. So this is the idea that pain windup can happen if you repeat a pain stimulus um, fast enough you get a, a higher and higher rating for this pain stimulus over time. That's called temporal summation in pain research. And so there was a reduction in temporal summation in these patients um, after the, both during and after the Raven stimulation. And interestingly enough, we also got this very, probably our most robust effect was in a reduction of anxiety, so an improvement in mood in these patients immediately after the, um, after the therapy. And this was the case for more, much more specifically for Raven stimulation than for the earlobe stimulation, the control earlobe stimulation. And there's been uh, recent review papers that have been published by um, Kathy Bushnell's lab down at the NIH that talk about vagus nerve stimulation actually being mediated by changes in mood in terms of its effect on pain. So does TVNS improve and reduce pain severity in patients by actually more targeting the mood aspect of these disorders? And you know, can we target this therapy to specific pain, popul pain popul subpopulations that are more affected by mood and depression and anxiety. Because that's not all chronic pain patients. So this has to do, I think, with better targeting of the neuromodulation approaches that are out there. We've also applied um, uh, Ravens with uh, neuroimaging studies in migraine. So this was a, um, a study we did with episodic migraine patients versus healthy controls. First, we localized the stimulation. This was one of our earliest neuro, um, neuroimaging studies that we did. And again, we found uh, this very small cluster in the pontomedullary junction as being more activated during the exhalatory gated stimulation than a sham stimulation. And we found that um, once you activate this NTS area, if you then use this NTS area to see what it's connected to in the rest of the brain, you see that there was greater connectivity between this area and cortical regions that are important for affect processing, such as the anterior insula and the cingulate cortex that were greater during the Raven's uh, stimulation condition than during the sham condition. And the amount of NTS connectivity to the anterior insula, which was interestingly related to the interictal phase, so where these migraine patients were in their cycle, so the, the closer you get to their next migraine attack, you're closer to 100% in their interictal phase index. The farther away you are from your previous migraine attack, you were, you're, you'd be around zero. And so we were studying these patients interictally, meaning they weren't having attacks while we were imaging them. But what was interesting is that the amount that, as NTS connectivity inc decreased to these uh, important um, affect processing areas, such as the insulin cingulate cortex, the more the patients got closer to their next attack, which is really interesting and suggests that we might be um, better off targeting stimulation during specific phases of their um, patients' migraine cycles. So we also looked at how Ravens affects trigeminosensory processing in these migraine patients. So here we delivered an air puff stimulation as a, kind of like a, a noxious stimuli to the forehead. This is a V1 territory of the trigeminal nerve, a cranial nerve. And we look to see brainstem, um, brainstem response to the stimulation. So first of all, brainstem response to the air puff stimulation, to this um, forehead stimulation, can be seen here um, in what I would argue is um, spinal trigeminal nucleus. It's actually, by the way, in the neuroimaging world, very difficult to assess where these clusters of activation are. There's not great atlases that are available for this. And so part of the reason why I'm showing you this is to kind of try to prove to you that you're actually targeting a different brainstem nuclei when we do uh, transcutaneous vagus nerve stimulation, which you know, I'm arguing is a nucleus tractus solitarius, versus this like putative spinal trigeminal nucleus, which would be more activated by forehead stimulation. Because you don't expect forehead stimulation, which is carried by the trigeminal nerve, to actually access nucleus tractus solitarius, which is the more vagus nerve region. So we also found that when you stimulate the trigeminal sensory system, the response is different after you go through, say, a 20 or 30 period of vagus nerve stimulation than before. And specifically, there's an increase in activation of trigeminal sensory afferents of these, again, important uh, neuromodulatory areas such as the nucleus raphi, which is the serotonergic processing source nuclei, 
and the locus ceruleus, which is the noradrenergic source nucleus over here, higher up in the ponds. This is now up in the ponds, you know, over, over here, whereas the NTS was down here where I was showing you before. So our ongoing research is now trying to combine this, what I guess I would consider kind of a bottom-up intervention of vagus nerve stimulation with top-down mind-body interventions for chronic pain. So in this case, we're trying to couple mindfulness meditation with Raven's TVNS, and we think that this is a good idea um, from both a conceptual and a neurophysiological level. So con conceptually speaking, the meditative state of mindfulness focuses intentions on one's own breathing with a calm and alert mind, promoting relaxation. So the focus here is that the breath is a key component of mindfulness meditation training, and this might be aided by complementary respiratory gated therapies such as Raven's TVNS. So our hypothesis here is that respiratory coupled pathways for mindfulness meditation mechanisms will also be potentiated by Raven's TVNS, which is a respiratory gated kind of a bottom up neuromodulatory therapy that converges on overlapping circuitry in the brain, higher up in the brain. And so specifically with uh, migraine pathophysiology, uh, some of our recent research has suggested that there's neuroinflammation uh, using PET imaging, I'm not going to get into the details here, is, um, is present in areas such as the um, hypothalamus, the thalamus, and the posterior insula. And these are areas that also have shown central sensitization in some of our previous migraine research as well. These areas, at least a, a portion of these areas, can then have an impact on autonomic outflow areas, such as the nucleus ambiguous and rostral ventrolateral medulla over here in the, um, in the, in the brainstem. And so our model here is that mindfulness meditation can impact these areas through connections through cortical areas, such as medial prefrontal cortex and anterior cingular cortex. And so we can assess that with a group that's going to get sham TVNS and mindfulness meditation training, um, whereas Raven's TVNS can modulate these same areas through input from the nucleus tractus solitarius, sort of, sort of a bottom-up pathway. And then we can have different modulations with this two-by-two -two design from our, that we'll, we'll be using for our study. And so we'll have three projects associated with this, one on central sensitization, one on autonomic dysfunction, one on neuroinflammation. And um, what we'll be testing for is a potential synergistic effect of mindfulness meditation training with respiratory-gated TVNS. And so this is our design. I'm not going to go into the details of this for sake of time. Um, we have a pilot that we've recently tried to combine these two therapies. Uh, in this case, we've actually picked a kind of a difficult population, um, but it's a population of convenience because of another PCORI study that's going on here in Boston where uh, there's um, chronic low back pain patients that are on opioids. They have to be on opioids to get into the study, and they've been trained in MBSR, or mindfulness-based stress reduction. They, th they then come in for two crossover sessions in randomized order, of either mindfulness audio guided mindfulness meditation with Ravens or with sham TVNS. And we have different QST outcomes, including um, barbaric things like sticking your hand into really ice cold water, which is very, very painful. And we look at this kind of testing before and after the um, audio guided mindfulness meditation with Ravens. And we, it's, it's very early days, so this is just very preliminary data, but there is some reason to believe that there's a reduction in cold pain intensity that's seen here. Blue is the um, active condition mindfulness meditation with Raven's TVNS, and also a reduction in the after sensations. The after sensations is even when the subject pulls their hand out of the water, it still is painful for up to 15 seconds after they pull their hand out of the water. So it's, it's promising, but still early days, and we're um, continuing to evaluate these effects. So in conclusion, uh, auricular TVNS targets NTS in the brainstem. Neurophysiological activity throughout the brain is entrained by respiration, which motivates respiratory-gated neuromodulation. NTS activation in cardiovagal modulation, such as high-frequency heart variability, can be enhanced by gating TVNS to exhalation. And Raven's TVNS also upregulates these kind of uh, neuromodulatory source nuclei, such as serotonergic, raphinuclei, and noradrenergic locus ceruleus in the brainstem. Raven's improves hyperalgesia, temporal summation, and anxiety levels in chronic pain patients 
potentially mediating longer-term improvements in pain. And that's actually something I really want to do in the future, is try to incorporate this intervention in a longitudinal study. We haven't done that yet, and partially because we don't have a device. This is basically a garage-made thing that, you know, we created like 10 years ago, and it's completely not portable. And so that's why we kind of reached out to industry to try to develop at least some sort of prototype that patients can bring home with them so we can use these in longitudinal studies. And so I'm also very excited about coupling RAVENS with other respiratory-focused uh, mind-body therapies, such as mindfulness meditations, as we look for potentially synergistic effects. Um, I you know, highly want to acknowledge a lot of this work was not done by me, but by postdocs and collaborators in the lab, specifically Ronald Garcia, Jung Chen Lee, and Roberta Skloko, who are postdocs and junior faculty in the lab, and my collaborations with Gael Desbords and Zev Schumann-Olivier, um, at the, um, uh, who are experts in mindfulness meditation research and are very heavily involved in these, um, in the program project grant and the synergistic um, studies that we're doing. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm very happy to answer questions. I can repeat the question. Yeah, at this time, but um, yeah. we have some mics roaming around. This way, the people in, in uh, streaming can also hear the question. So, if you want to so the, the question was on uh, duration of intervention and how long do you have to stimulate for for these effects to last? We don't know. I don't have the answer to that question. Um, we, you know, we go by typical stimulation sessions that have been done in the past by other TVNS devices, and those are typically 25 minutes to half an hour. You know, is it better if you do it twice a day instead of once a day? Maybe. You know, can you go down to less, you know, 10 or 15 minutes? Maybe not. You know, I, I, I really don't know the answer to that question. We just need more research. Yeah. Um, was this research inspired by Ujjayi breathing? the self-stimulation of the vagus nerve? Um, I, I, no, it was not, because I don't know what that is. OK. So there, yeah, please. Oh, well, it's, it's a breathing practice, a traditional breathing practice that would be combined with a seated meditation practice that mm -hmm. is a self-stimulation through your breathing rhythms that um, activates, stimulates the vagus nerve. Right. I mean, I know there's different, you know, yogic practices that very much focus on, you know, on different respiratory patterns, and some are, you know, very deep breaths, very fast, and there's, there's different respiratory. So <laughs> respiration has been hijacked a lot by different mind-body therapies in order to impact, you know, clinical effects. Right. And so that's kind of, I, I, think, I think there's a real sort of potential marriage there between respiratory-gated neuromodulation and other respiratory-based therapies, including, you know, yogic therapies as well. Yeah, right. Something maybe for the future. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's a question. Thank you for the presentation. It was very stimulating. Um, my question is, you said auricular uh, stimulator, uh, 100 uh, hertz is much uh, effective than the lower. Have you ever tried even going uh, beyond 100, like 400? Yeah, that, that was, that's, a, that's a natural question. And when we first designed that study, we were going under the principle that 25 hertz, which is what we've been using in the past, is the most effective stimulation because that's what was previously published. And that's what we previously had used in our experiments. So we weren't expecting for 100 hertz to be the most effective stimulation when we did that experiment. We thought, you know, that's kind of like you want a lower bound, you want an upper bound, and, you know, you're hoping for some sort of like U-shaped effect. And that's not what we saw. So it's, it's not so much what I'm saying, it's what the data showed us. And in this particular case, 100 hertz was more effective in targeting NTS. So the follow-up study would naturally be, you know, what about 150 hertz? What about 200 hertz? Since we know that we haven't found some sort of local, local maxima there, uh, we probably have to do more research to look at higher frequency stimulations as well. Yeah. I have a, I have a question from one of our um, viewers using Slido, and they were asking about uh, what prompted you to use uh, your factorial design, the sort of two by two to look at synergy, and whether you'd considered some other uh, models. Well, partially it's because placebo effects are very prominent and so important in research and in research in mind-body therapies in general. 
and we wanted to control as best we could for some of these effects. And with a program project grant, you know, there's enough support there to try to run multiple groups and have multiple control groups. And that's how we, that's why we designed it that way. And I had a question going back to your um, study with healthy people, the most recent one, where you used some validations to show that there was no changes in the perceived intensity, but also there's no changes in breathing rate. Um, mm. So that the number of yeah. points, times that they were stimulated would be equal. But one would think that after being stimulated for a while with vagal tone, you know, that your breathing rate might change. So I'm wondering if... You can so by the way, that. nobody that's at this talk is allowed to volunteer for any of my studies. And so so it's, it's, it's surprising, but people, if you don't tell people that you're stimulating them in tune with respiration, they do not figure it out. We've done this in over 100 individuals now, safely, I want to add. And um, nobody has said, huh, it feels like it's you know, stimulating me like, in tune with my breathing. Now, that might change if we start coupling this with mindfulness, you know, meditation, and things like that. I don't know. But, um, but it's, what's interesting is that people don't figure it out. And they, so they don't change their respiration because they don't realize that that's something that will change their stimulation. Yeah, but I guess I was wondering, it's not so much a conscious one, but that through parasympathetic activity, one's breathing mm. rate might biologically slow down. Yeah, I mean, we, we've looked at it, and that doesn't appear to be the case. Respiration rate does not change. Um, I have a question. Yeah, let's... let's oh, someone else? Oh, oh, here. Um, can you explain again, or m more in depth, or I'm not a scientist, the relationship between um, your the, the 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 heartbeat or, or the rhythm of of inhalation and exhalation and your device being different from it you you said that you tried to you tried to make it different um so the the heartbeat uh we've had some studies that have shown that heart rate variability changes in response to the stimulation right and so the heartbeat variability is not so much the heart rate but how does the heart rate change over time and so th this has been found to be a marker for cardio, what's called cardiovagal outflow. So the amount of parasympathetic drive to the heart, which is considered to be a good thing. And so the, the increase in high frequency heart rate variability is suggestive of an increase in parasympathetic drive to the heart, which is cardioprotective. It's considered to be cardioprotective by most people. And so this is considered a good thing. And so what the data that I showed was that um, when you stimulate with exhalatory gated Ravens, exhalatory gated transcutaneous vagus nerve stimulation, you are increasing high frequency heart rate variability, at least in the short term, and we have to look whether that is still the case long term as well. Yeah. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the correlation between um, signaling that you see um, in the various regions that you're studying and pain relief? And also, can you um, talk a little bit about what you see as kind of the frequency of a treatment, um, like over a day? Is it something you wear all day long, or is it something you wear at night or when you have an attack? Yeah, it's, it, it's a great question, and this is why I want to do the longitudinal studies I want to do, because right now I can't, I, I can't answer that question. The, um, the immediate effects that we're getting with the neuroimaging, um, we haven't specifically looked at QST outcomes or pain outcomes during those neuroimaging studies. And in terms of longitudinally, we haven't had a device that we could use in these longitudinal studies to see what happens and how that's linked to the brain responses. And so the, um, this migraine study that we're hopefully going to be starting very soon will hope to answer some of those important questions to try to link the neuroimaging outcomes, the brain outcomes that we're going to be taking with longer-term pain outcomes in these patients. But yeah, I mean, I think that's ultimately what we want to do because we want to use neuroimaging as kind of a, a marker for successful therapy to try to titrate this therapy, to look at different parameters like frequency. You know, I just showed you frequency, right? 
um, of TVNS and which frequency might be most effective. And I showed you respiration. There might be a specific phase of the respiratory cycle that's most effective for stimulation. But there's a whole host of other parameters. And there's no way we can run clinical studies to go through all these whole host of other parameters to see which is going to be optimized, which is going to be most effective. So we need these kind of uh, immediate markers to try to predict you know, which therapy is going to be most effective for which subject and which parameter is going to be most effective. Yeah, there's a microphone. Yeah. Maybe totally unrelated to what you're doing, but I have a friend with myasthenia gravis. Would stimulation of the vagus nerve when she's having a crisis have any benefit? I, it's an interesting. Thing. I don't know. I, I don't know very much about myasthenia gravis. Yeah, it, um, it's a poorly so. understood disease. Yeah. Where you, the, it, the muscles become much very weak. Yeah. That's why I thought if you could increase the stimulation to the muscles, that might be helpful. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't know about the effects of mycenae gravis. Well, I knew that this was going to be an amazing presentation, and Vitaly did not disappoint. Um, and uh, it's just so exciting to know about this research that's going on here um, at the medical school and really looking for these bridges between really rigorous um, evidence-based research and ways that could change clinical practice. So I know there's some acupuncturists here. It could be really interesting. After they receive their stimulation in the clinic, they're given a device, um, and some of the parameters are set to continue this, this therapy as they go home. It's like a prescription. So I, I think there's really a lot of promise that's going to grow out of this, and the interaction of that with mindfulness practices. Maybe even while we're doing Tai Chi, we can be stimulated or doing yoga so that we, we, we have a better sense of the physiological state that we're targeting with our own practice. It can even be a tool for teaching us how to move closer to these sort of mind-body states that we're, we're trying to get to. So I want to thank uh, Vitali for such a great presentation. And um, I also have a couple announcements. So uh, next month we shift to a clinical grand round and Aditi Nuroker from the uh, Chen Sui Center is going to be presenting a case uh, with her colleagues and the patient on pancreatic cancer, uh, an integrative approach to treating pancreatic cancer. Um, I want to remind people that our pilot grant um, program, which uh, disperses um, pilot grants for um, collaborative research in integrated medicine, is open to receiving um, new applications. And I believe your fellowship, right, Gloria, the T32 Integrative Medicine Fellowship um, it is um, open until October 1, so that's still receiving applications as well. Um, we have a little um, gathering um, outside for some continued discussion and some refreshments.